Let's now take a moment to hear a rhema word from the Holy Ghost, from the prophet's cave. Good afternoon, Greater New Haven. My name's Peter Haddad, and it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon. As uh, Brother Coleman mentioned, we're going to be speaking this afternoon about a very misunderstood subject in the church, the subject of, of tithing. Um, when, when Apostle Coleman and I first spoke about me coming to speak to you, um, he asked me if I would speak about tithing. He and I had a rather lengthy conversation about tithing, and uh, he asked if I would, if I would uh, be willing to come and share on uh, this broadcast uh, on the subject, and I said I would. I have to tell you up front that um, this is probably not the most popular talk you're going to hear about tithing. Um, it's probably not, uh, well, it's probably not the first. For those of you who, who don't know what tithing is, um, let me tell you what tithing is. The word tithe is just an old, old word. I don't even know what original language it was from, but it's an old word that means a tenth. For example, um, if you have a hundred of something, a tithe of that would be ten, one-tenth of whatever you have. Now, we use the, the verb to tithe or tithing to describe taking that tenth and giving it. And typically we talk about giving it to the church and the church frequently uses the word tithing to describe giving that's done to the church. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. And let me, let me just tell you right up front that I'm not going to ask you to give me any money or to give Brother Coleman any money, or to give your church any more money. This is not about money. This is not a talk for fundraising. This is a talk for the purpose of, of uh, clarifying um, what we talk about a lot in the church, which is money. Now, what, what's interesting is in Deuteronomy chapter 12, we have something very interesting. I'm going to read you a couple of verses, uh, beginning at verse 6. It says, there you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks, and there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. Now, it's very interesting because we see in, in Deuteronomy that this tithe that the 11 tribes are giving, ostensibly to support the 12th tribe, is being eaten by the people who gave it. Verse 7 says, take your, take your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, your heave offering, your tithe, everything you bring to the Lord, and eat it before the Lord. So in Deuteronomy chapter 12, it's very interesting. We have people eating their own tithe. Now, Imagine if you went into a church, a uh, place of worship, um, and they told you to take your tithe, your 10% of your income, that normally you're told that's what you're supposed to give, and consume it yourself, and buy stuff that you would consume yourself. That would seem very unlikely and very unusual, would it not? But in Deuteronomy chapter 12, we see two places in Deuteronomy chapter 12 where the people are instructed to do just exactly that, They're told to eat their own tithe. If you turn then to Deuteronomy chapter 14, they're instructed to do the same thing again. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, it's, it's very interesting in the way, oh, there goes my stuff all over the ground. It's very interesting the way the people are instructed regarding the tithe. And I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read quite a few verses from Deuteronomy chapter 14. Um, Beginning at verse 22, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord your God. Thank you, my good brother. That's what happens when you stuff all kinds of things in your Bible, fall out on the ground. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, 
the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you're not able to carry the tithe. Now remember, their tithe was not in the form of money necessarily. It could have been the first fruits of their uh, wheat crop, or it could have been the first fruits, 10% of their flock, or it could have been 10% of a, a, um, um, a herd of cows. But if the journey is too long for you so that you're not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange the tithe for money, take the money in your hand, and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. But you shall not forsake the Levite. Remember the one that didn't have an inheritance in the land? You shall not forsake the Levite who was within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And listen to this. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Now, what's significant about that? We... We are told that our giving is to be done only to the church. And the Bible says that that tithe is to be given to the Levite, the people who support the house of God, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. So imagine, if you will, we normally hear in churches that we're supposed to take 10% and give it to God in the church. But the Bible says that that 10% is supposed to be divvied up. Fatherless, widow, they're speaking about, the Bible is speaking about people who have needs, strangers, people who have, now remember, in an agrarian culture, where, where you can't just go and get a job at a gas station temporarily, in an agrarian culture, you go on a long journey, it's hard to find something to eat. You've got a stranger in the land, you know, he may be on, on the edge of starvation. So the Bible specifically says here to the people that when they come into their promised land, the land of Israel that God was giving to them, that that 10% that they were supposed to give was to, supposed to support the Levites who took care of the temple and the fatherless and the widow, people who have needs, and strangers in the land. So it's supposed to be divvied, divvied up wherever there are needs. And there's a portion of it that's supposed to be consumed by the tither himself. And if he doesn't want to consume what he has, he can take what he has and cash it in and buy something that he wants, whatever his heart desires. It's not exactly the picture of tithing and giving that we have in the church today. It's, it's very, very different. And I dare say that in many, I'm not even going to say most, but in many churches, teaching this scripture is considered dangerous because there's the fear that people will stop giving to the church. But remember what I told you early on when I started to speak to you. The amount that is given to anyone anywhere is controlled by the Spirit of God in the individual heart. And by the Spirit of God in the individual heart of the giver, and by the Spirit of God in the heart of the recipient. Because to be sure, if the heart of the receiver isn't right, God's not going to fill the pockets of someone who's just not right. Well, let me take that back. God may allow someone who's not right to get his pockets filled. But the blessing of God will not necessarily accompany full pockets. God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is in control of what is given and what is received by being in control of the heart of both. I'm not afraid to tell people that if I was pastoring a church full-time right now, that they're not necessarily obligated to bring 10% of everything they have to my church to support my church. 
It's my obligation to trust God that my ministry will be supported if in fact I do what it is that I'm supposed to do. And that's my obligation to do what it is that I'm supposed to do. So we see so far in the Pentateuch, in the law giving of the church, we see that the tithe first appears where a fellow named Abraham gave money directly to God. Then the tithe appears where the people are instructed what to do with their tithe, and that is support the tribe that didn't get any land when the other tribes did. Then we see that the tithe is to be divvied up, not just to that tribe that didn't get land, but to wherever there were needs. And surely if there was enough, then the person who was giving could consume some of it himself. It's a, it's a, a slightly, well not slightly, it's actually a radically different picture of, uh, of what we see tithing portrayed as in the churches today. I once heard a, uh, a minister who was teaching a class. He talked about uh, a dog on a short leash is less likely to bite anyone. And he was referring to the way he believed ministers should run their churches. His idea was that if the pastors and ministers in established organized churches kept their members on a short leash, they were less likely to do something wrong, less likely to do something that supposedly God would disapprove of. And his analogy was that a dog kept on a short leash is less likely to bite. The truth of the matter is, there's no leash in the world that can leash my heart. And where sin happens is in the human heart, not in the human hand. You may see me do all the things you think I should be doing as a man of God, but you don't know my heart. In my heart, I could be killing you, or hating you, or bad-mouthing you, or slandering you. I could be hypocritical about the way I tell you that I love you in your face, and when you don't see me, maybe I'm, maybe I'm talking badly about you. You, don't, you can't leash the human heart. And to tell people what I believe is the biblical truth about tithing, to be afraid to tell people what I believe is the biblical truth about tithing, is wrong. Because you can't control what people are going to do with their money. Because what they do with what they have in their hand, whether it's money or anything else, is a direct result of what's in their heart. And there's not a set of rules or regulations in the whole wide world, in any church, in any organization, in any place of worship, in any ministry, anywhere, that can control the human heart. Only the Spirit of God can control the human heart. And if the Spirit of God is in control of the human heart, the giver and the receiver don't have anything to worry about. Now, you might think that's a little altruistic or pie in the sky or <clears throat> whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's real and it's true. God's real. Um, it's not like we talk about God and, and when things are going right, oh, God must be real. And when things are going wrong, oh, God's not real. That's not the way it is. God is real. And he is, he is working in our lives and in our hearts through the circumstances in our lives Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad, and he chooses. So, um, the next concept I want to talk about, we, 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 we've, we've talked about tithing, uh, where we first see it, what the instructions for tithing were. I, I want to talk for a second about where the idea came from that all your tithe, that your whole 10% is supposed to be given to the church, and whatever other giving you do um, is up to you, but 10% is supposed to be given to the church. That's commonly known as storehouse tithing. Why is it known as storehouse tithing? Well, it's known as storehouse tithing because the place in Scripture where people go to support that idea, in the last book of this old section, known as Malachi, the book of Malachi uses that expression storehouse tithing. 
and I'll show you where. Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now you hear that in churches all the time. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse and prove me, God says, that if you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, I'll pour you out such a blessing, there won't even be room to receive it. And that's what you hear. And people are taught to believe that if they bring all their tithe into the storehouse, meaning the church, the place of worship, the organized local assembly, if you will, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, and God will pour you out a blessing so much that the, 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 the doors will be busting out and the windows will be busting out. But the if is, if you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, then you'll get that blessing. And if you don't bring all the tithe into the storehouse, then you won't get that blessing. Now, I say in my Bibles all these studies all the time that Bible study is a thoughtful pursuit. This is a big book. There's a lot of information in here. And there's a lot of controversial information in here. And most people disagree about what it says. Bible study is a thoughtful pursuit. And context is king. What is context? Context is the examination of what's going on with whom and why regarding what you're reading. What was going on with Malachi? Who was Malachi and why was he writing this? Well, that's a good question. And you really can't understand what Malachi is saying about um, you've robbed God, you haven't brought the tithe into the storehouse. You don't understand what Malachi is talking about unless you understand who Malachi is or what. Now Malachi was a prophet and Malachi was prophesying to the children of Israel and what was he prophesying about? Malachi was prophesying about the people's disobedience. They had in fact robbed God. But it wasn't a robbery in that they didn't bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Let's, let's recap what's going on historically when Malachi was writing. Um, the, and in order to do that, you have to turn back to the book of Nehemiah. For those of you who have your Bibles, turn back to the book of Nehemiah. I'm not going to turn back to it and read. I actually have the verses that I want printed here. Um, back to Nehemiah. And I'm going to ask you to look at Nehemiah chapter 9 and Nehemiah chapter 10. What's going on in history? Um, the Jewish people, the people of Israel, had a, uh, a couple of bad habits. On a regular basis, they would disobey God and they would be unfaithful to God. And when they were unfaithful to God, frequently, God would have them conquered by some of the people who surrounded their land. They were conquered by the Philistines. Uh, they were conquered by the uh, uh, Assyrians. They were conquered by the Babylonians. They were frequently conquered by the people who were in the land before they got there. And God would allow them to be conquered by the people who were in the land when they were disobedient. Now, Nehemiah chapter 9 um, talks about... Um, part of the history of Israel that we in the world of theology we refer to it as the Deuteronomic cycle. Um, the book of Nehemiah chapter 9 is what's known as the Deuteronomic cycle. The Deuteronomic cycle is a uh, kind of a listing of all the times when the children of Israel would disobey God, get in trouble, repent, God would restore. They'd disobey God, they'd get in trouble, they'd repent, God would restore. It's kind of like the way we live in our lives. You know, the, the picture of my life over the past 25 years that I've known God has frequently been, I'll do something disobedient, 
I'll get in trouble, I'll cry out to God and repent, and He'll restore me. And then, you know, almost inevitably, I do something I'm not supposed to do, get in trouble, cry out to God, repent, and He would restore me. Nehemiah chapter 9 is where it's, it's like a, one story after another, and I, and I never counted how many of them there are, but there are a number where there was that cycle, and then it happened again, and then it happened again, and then it happened again, and then it happened again. Well, who was this guy, Nehemiah, that he would write such a thing? Well, here's who he was. Nehemiah was uh, a Jew, and he was living in Babylon or Persia. Now, now Babylon is modern-day Iraq, and Persia is modern-day Iran. And that entire area uh, was frequently referred to as the Assyrian Empire or the Babylonian Empire or the Empire of the Medes and the Persians. So that whole part of the world had captured Israel, and they took all the people of Israel and they yanked them out of the promised land that God gave them and brought them into that Babylonian, Assyrian, Medo-Persian Empire. And the land of Israel, including Jerusalem and the walls that were around Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was a walled city, had fallen into ruin. So one day, Nehemiah, who had a job as the wine taster in this Babylonian king's palace, Nehemiah one day is walking around the palace and he's And he had a good relationship with the king. Obviously, he was the king's wine taster. He was, he was risking his life for the king every day because if the wine was poisoned, it would be the wine taster that would die. And so the king said, Nehemiah, what's wrong? Why are you downcast? Why does your face look like that? And Nehemiah said, I'm a Jew, and Jerusalem is in ruin. The walls are broken down. The city's no good. Israel's a mess. My hometown, my homeland, my home city, it's all a mess. What have I got to be happy about? And, and the king said, Nehemiah, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. Is there anything I can do to help? And Nehemiah said, yeah. He said, you can give me some dough and give me a bunch of guys, and we'll go back to Jerusalem, and we'll rebuild the city. You're going to find out what this has to do with tithing in a minute. So Nehemiah got money, and he got permission from this Babylonian king that had captured Israel to go back to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, the, kind of like the nerve center of Judaism, and rebuild what had been allowed to go into ruin when the people were captured and brought away to Babylon. Okay, so Nehemiah goes back, brings a bunch of guys with him, and God blesses them to have enough money and enough people to rebuild Israel, rebuild Jerusalem, and rebuild the wall. They have trouble, they have struggles, they have difficulties, they have guys try to stop them, they have, they have armies of invaders come and try to get them, and, they have to, and they're rebuilding the wall with a sword in one hand and a, and, a, and a trowel in the other to put the bricks and the stones back in the wall. And it's a really exciting story of how God restored Jerusalem through the hands of Nehemiah and a guy named Ezra and a bunch of other people that rebuilt Jerusalem. Now, when Jerusalem got rebuilt, Ezra and Nehemiah went in front of the people and they had the book of the law and they started reading it to the people and the people realized how terrible Israel had treated God. God had blessed them, God had given them the land and now God had just restored them in their land after they'd been captured and the people were all excited and they were happy and here's what they were doing in Nehemiah chapter 9. In Nehemiah chapter 9 they were swearing that this cycle of sin get in trouble, repent, God restores. Sin, get in trouble, repent, God restores. Sin, get in trouble, repent, God restores. They were swearing that they were going to break that cycle. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, and then Nehemiah chapter 10, they swear they're going to break that cycle, and then they make what we call their New Year's resolution. Their New Year's resolution says, oh, let me see if I've got it written here. They created a document Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to do the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and everyone who had knowledge and understanding, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. They made an oath to walk in God's law 
and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his ordinances and his statutes. And we won't do anything wrong. We'll honor the Sabbath. We'll do exactly what we're supposed to do. So they make their New Year's resolution. In the course of making that New Year's resolution and them promising God what they're going to do and God telling them what it is they're supposed to do, we come to Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38. Let me go back up to verse 35. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits. Now we're getting back into the giving. We're getting back into the giving idea again. We're going to start talking about the giving again because remember, we're talking about tithing. We're talking about storehouse tithing. Where does this idea come from that we take the 10% and bring it to the storehouse or bring it to the church house? And um, we said it comes from Malachi because Malachi said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse and you'll get blessed. Remember? So now, why are we talking about Nehemiah? Because Malachi was the priest at the time that Nehemiah rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. Malachi was, I'm sorry, he was the prophet. Malachi was the prophet of God during the time that Nehemiah built, rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. And when Nehemiah finished rebuilding the city, everybody said, oh, we've done God wrong, and they made their New Year's resolution, and they said, we're not going to act like that anymore. We're going we're gonna to do what we're supposed to do. And here we are in, in Nehemiah chapter 10. Uh, and we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruits and all trees year by year to the house of the Lord, to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees. Now, mind you, it doesn't say anything about tenth yet. It doesn't say anything about tithe yet. It's talking about first fruits to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offering, the fruit from all kinds of trees, new wine and oil to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities. And the priest, the descendant of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithe of our God to the rooms of of the storehouse. We see in Nehemiah that there is not a command to bring all the tithe into the storehouse. There's a command to bring a tenth of the tithes. The priests and Levites were commanded to bring a tenth of the tithes into the storehouse where the articles of the sanctuaries are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. So, the promise was in Nehemiah that the priest's job were to take a tenth of the tenth, a tenth of the tithe, and use that so that the house of God will not be neglected. And that is Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. The house of God would not be neglected because a tenth of the tenth, or one one hundredth for you math majors, a tenth of the tenth would be brought to the storehouse so that the house of God would not be neglected. Now, that's what they promised in their New Year's resolution that they were going to do when God restored them in Jerusalem and God restored the temple. They promised that they were going to do that. Well, about ten years later, when this guy Malachi was prophesying, we discover, lo and behold, that the people had lied. They didn't bring the tithe where they were supposed to bring it, and the priests didn't take a tenth of the tithe and put it in the storehouse that God's house wasn't neglected. In fact, they had fallen back into the same dirty, rotten, nasty habits that we saw in Nehemiah chapter 9 with that cycle of sin. They were right back in the same place. And the prophet Malachi came along to the people of Israel just about 10 years after God blessed Nehemiah to rebuild the temple and rebuild the wall, just about 10 years later, they were right back in the same condition it was before God had blessed them. And Malachi was sent to the people and said, now look, you robbed God. I restored you, and you've gone right back and messed up the same way you messed up before. Now here's what I want you to do. This time, instead of bringing a tenth of the tithe into the storehouse that God's house isn't neglected, bring all the tithe into the storehouse and prove me. God said, if you don't, if you don't think I'm going to do this, bring all the tithe into the storehouse and watch how much I bless you. But first I want to see your commitment. 
So this command to bring all the tithe into the storehouse was a specific command given by the prophet Malachi to a backslidden people. God had just restored them to build the wall, build the temple, rebuild Jerusalem. Roughly 10 years later, the place is falling back into ruin. And Malachi says, don't you remember that New Year's resolution you made 10 years ago? And part of that New Year's resolution was to bring a tenth of the tenth. You couldn't do it. You messed up, and now you expect me to bless you? You want me to bless you? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring all the tithe into the storehouse and watch me bless you as a result of your obedience. That was a specific command to those people regarding bringing the tithe to the storehouse. Now, here's what we've done in the church. We have taken the idea of that tithe, that tenth, in the storehouse all the way now into the church. And we say that everybody in the church, based on this scripture, is supposed to bring 10% of everything they get a hold of into the church, because that's the storehouse, and the Bible says bring 10% into the storehouse. Well, the Bible doesn't really say bring 10% into the storehouse. Malachi said it to those people in Nehemiah's day because they had been disobedient. They were supposed to bring a tenth of a tenth into the storehouse that God's house didn't get neglected, and they didn't do it. And the rebuke to them was to bring a tenth, of the whole tenth, the whole tithe, into the storehouse. It's dangerous when we take an idea that we find in Scripture and bring it forward out of its context. This was taking a moment to hear a rhema word from the Holy Ghost coming from the prophet's cave. Thank you. See you next time.